Greetings, adventurers, and welcome to Skill Tree, where we learn how to do just about everything. I have a fun one for us today. Today, we're going to learn how to make some epic armor, specifically a leather cuirass, and specifically, specifically, a leather cuirass for my Ranger Gareth for the Reckoning LARP that's coming up. Now, I made one of these three years back or so when I was all young and full of dreams and hope and hair dye. Seriously, like, look at me here. But I've learned a lot since then, not just about hair and self-esteem, but about leather crafting, and I'm super excited to go over some of it with you. Like I said, we've gone over a leather a lot on this channel since then, so there might be some smaller topics that I gloss over while making this project. If at any point you feel lost, check out this playlist up here that has all of my like leather projects I've ever done so far. You can follow me from the very beginning of not knowing anything to making this project here. Also, make sure you stick around to the end because we're going to be announcing our level 2 winners from the Level Up LARP competition. We've got an exciting episode today. So, without much further ado, let's jump right into it and level up this skill. Alright, so first things first, we're going to need a plan for this thing. Luckily, Oddest Extraordinaire and my business partner, Matty, came up with this right here. Now, I've never done like that scale pattern in armor before, so I'm really excited to give it a try. So the last time I designed a similar piece of armor, I ended up just using like a t-shirt, which I taped onto myself and then cut up. You can see that if you check out that video. But this time I don't have to because I have my foam golem. Look at this sexy boy here. I'm so glad I have him. If you want to see how to make your own foam mannequin, you can check out this episode here. Anyways. Step one is protecting my precious, precious creation with a little bit of saran wrap. I just went ahead and covered him completely with this stuff in a weird impression of Dexter. Seriously, out of context, I'm wrapping just a torso in plastic wrap in my basement. No, yeah, I can see why people think that's strange now. Huh. And once he's all wrapped up in plastic, it's time to start adding on the duct tape. Nope, not getting less creepy. I found that using individual strips of tape works better than just wrapping it all the way around as it helps keep everything nice and smooth. Once I've completely covered the surface in duct tape, we can start to lay down our template lines. So I was worried about just kind of taking a marker and, and kind of freehanding this thing because if I make a mistake, it's gonna be hard and then I'm gonna have all these different lines. That's when I came up with a really good idea, actually. I just busted out a dry erase marker. This way, my inevitable screw-ups won't be such a big deal. First, I just drew in the lines I knew would have to be there, like where the front and back panel of this piece of armor would separate, which is right along the shoulders, as well as along the sides underneath the arms. I also drew a straight line down the center so that I could try to keep everything nice and symmetrical as best as I could. All right, so this time around, I'm gonna employ the stuff that I learned from my last build. This, by the way, is my last build. And I specifically wanna pay attention to the arm holes and the neck here. Honestly, the stomach would have been an issue too, but I made this kind of cool accordion thing happen here, like a pill bug armor, so it didn't really get in the way. But as you can see with how wide this is here, that opening actually came all the way to just like the sides of my shoulders, which is a real pain when you're trying to like swing a sword or you're trying to hold anything like this because this space gets much smaller. The same with the space up here. Every time I lifted my arm up, the armor would jab into my neck. By the time I was done using it, I had like bruises all here, bruises here, bruises here. Like it was very uncomfortable. <laughs> Which makes sense because when you look at like actual historical armor that was used in battle, like this portion here is much smaller exactly to accommodate for that. Now for me, I found that when I put my arms like this, this space here is about how big it would be if I went from the tip of my middle finger to the tip of my, uh, my thumb here. So I just used that spacing as measurement to let me know how far to let those arm holes go. Then I drew that circle, also leaving a fair enough amount of space underneath my armpit to make sure I have full range of motion. Again, looking at your own anatomy, like your chest muscle comes up here and then your lats come over here. So if you don't allow enough room for that, that armor, it really digs into those muscle groups. And I'm not like a big guy, but it, it digs. <laughs> Same deal with where your neckline lands. The last one I did came kind of in line with my collarbones, which meant every time I bent down or every time I sat, the armor just kind of jabbed up into my throat. So this time I made a mark about three inches down from my collarbone to give me enough space to deal with that. Finally, because the stomach area is solid, I made sure that the bottom didn't go more than a couple of inches past my belly button. This will give me enough room to actually bend down without it jamming into my groin or again, pushing back up into my neck. One last consideration is this kind of like side to side motion here. Again, looking at your own anatomy where you actually bend is a little bit higher up just above your hip bones. So with that in mind, I made some marks right where that would land on my golem. Then I simply connected my lines together to start to really flesh out this shape. 
Now I'm only gonna be using one side of this to make it symmetrical, you'll see what I mean in a little bit, but just so I can get the visual, I drew in the other side as well, trying to keep it as even as I could. Everything in the middle is less dire as it doesn't really get in the way of anything, so I just kind of started freehanding things in, erasing what I didn't think looked right, and really just honing it in until I love the look of it. Moving on to the back, I did a lot of the same considerations, feeling out my own body to see like how much my arm moves, so I can tell how much material I was able to leave without it getting in my way. Your body's gonna be different than mine, so just continue to like test out where things land so you can figure out how big your openings need to be. Once I had all my panel designs in place, I started putting in some of my markings to make sure I knew where everything landed. Basically just adding little arrows and such so I knew where panels slid underneath other panels, where the scales will end up going, and labeling each separate panel so I wouldn't lose track. With that all good, it was time to get surgical and cut out my armor pattern. I just used an X-Acto blade to this and made sure I didn't cut too, too deeply. By just following those outside lines, I was able to easily separate this from my mannequin, giving me my front and back plate to work with. And with those free, I went ahead and cut along my lines so that I can see what every individual plate would need to be. Thus far, this method's working really well. I'm pretty sure I could just use these pieces as my templates and go from there. That said, I want everything to be as symmetrical as possible. So as I said, I'm just gonna end up using half of my templates and then doubling them up. Here's how I do that. I start with some cardstock that I fold in half. Then I choose whichever half of my armor I like the best and line that up along the center line of that folded piece of paper. Then I trace the shape of it out with my pencil. This doesn't need to be 100% perfect because no matter what, it's gonna be symmetrical. Just make sure you make it as close as you can. Oh, and a special note, for all of the pieces of those plates that are gonna slide underneath other pieces, you need to make sure you add a little bit of extra material so there's like an attachment point, right? So as you see in this picture here, I add an extra three quarters of an inch all along the side that's gonna end up sliding underneath another panel. So just remember, anywhere there's that overlap, you're gonna need to add some of that extra material. Cool, and with that all drawn out, it was a simple matter of going back in with my X-Acto blade to cut out these bad boys. And as you can see, once they're freed, the design is perfectly symmetrical. I got every piece out like this, except for the pieces there'll be two of, like the side panel here, that I can just flip over to make a second one mirroring the other. After getting both the back and front panels done, it was time to test this thing out. Now with the last piece of armor there, I actually just taped all of my paper templates together and tried to slide them on. Wasn't the best thing to do. I ripped a lot of paper. It was kind of a pain. Also, the paper isn't the right thickness, so things end up being a little bit more tight when the actual material is in place. So this time around, I'm busting out some of this craft foam here, which is much closer to my leather's thickness. I just got this stuff from Michael's for like eight bucks. To use it, I simply put my patterns on top of them and then cut it out of the foam. I use a technique similar to this when I was making my bag of excellent expansion. And one of you geniuses in the comments section was like, hey, don't tape these things together. Instead, use these little push pin things here. These are fasteners used to hold papers together and stuff, and they have these two little legs that are easily bent into place. Using them was super simple. I just poked it through my foam everywhere that a rivet would go, and then bent those legs into place to lock everything together. Doing that only took me about 10 minutes to put all of my foam templates together to give it a try. I just added a little bit of tape wherever like a belt buckle or something would end up so I could adjust it as needed. And putting this thing on, I was really stoked about the fit. I know at first glance it might seem like a little bit small, but again, this is how armor was historically made so you can actually move around and things. So as you can see, that middle area leaves me just enough room so that I can either use both of my arms to hold the greatsword or swing my arm as much as I need without the leather digging into my bicep and chest. Same with the area around my neck. You can see if I pick my arm up, there's just enough space where the leather just starts to touch my neck but doesn't dig in. Finally, I can bend at my waist and there's just enough space where the leather will just begin to get in my way at the bottom of that bend. And I have completely free motion from side to side as the armor sits right atop my waist where that bend happens. You can also see in this armhole here at the bottom where my pectoral and latissimus muscles kind of come over the top of that opening. So there's just enough room so that doesn't grind against me in any way. I learned a whole bunch from that last example and just everywhere a bruise or like a rash formed. It hurts so much. <laughs> Those little temporary rivets were an amazing idea. So whichever of you left that in the comment section, like you're awesome, thank you. They're even super easy to take back off once done. All right, so now that we know we have a working template that we're happy with, it's time to actually put this stuff on leather. <sighs> Another leather project where Tandy isn't sponsoring us. Honestly, at this point, I'm starting to give up What's that? I'm sorry, Tandy 
is sponsoring us. We've been waiting for this for years. Literally every tool I use and every leather project I've ever done has all been Tandy stuff. We've been working so hard for this for so long. This is a banner day for us here on the channel. Congratulations all of you who have stuck around this long. And look at this beautiful 9 ounce veg tan side they sent me. Oh, it's absolutely gorgeous. I've never had leather this thick be this supple before. Just look at how it drapes. It almost feels milled. It's beautiful. It's so funny. My contact at Tandy's is just it's so awesome. We have a Tandy's sponsorship. But yeah, she asked me, do you want this like the Craftman side or like the super expensive Quebaracho chestnut side? And I'm like, let's see what I can get away with. I would like the Quebaracho, please. And they sent it and it is amazing. All right, I'll stop gushing, but it's, it's really good stuff. Now you're gonna notice that I'm using my foam templates here to put onto the leather. That's because when I had them all connected together, I could see where there'd be like little tiny overlaps or something that I didn't want, so I could just barely trim them away. That makes these the most accurate templates though. To keep these still, I just added a bit of gaffer's tape to them to keep them down. Masking tape would work well too, just anything that doesn't leave a residue behind. Then I just used my X-Acto knife to score all around my pieces to get my marks into place. Then once I removed those templates, it was easy to go back in with my razor knife and finish those cuts. As always, make sure you're using a fresh blade when you're cutting leather, not only to get a nicer cut, but also just to keep yourself safe so that blade doesn't jump around on you. As I went, I laid out everything in the configuration it would end up in, just so I can make sure I'm not missing any pieces. With all my panels cut out, it was finally time to figure out the scale parts. As I said, I've never done this technique before, so I'm just kind of winging it from here. Luckily, I have a second roll of this incredible leather, this time in six ounce. Oh, it's so friggin' good. I, there's a difference between like the really expensive leather and the, the Craftman. There's such a big difference. It's amazing. All right, so this is how I figured this is gonna work. To actually make those scale shapes, I'm gonna be using something called a pointed end punch. This thing has, like it says on the tin, a pointed end, which then comes out to nice even arcs on either side. This one just so happens to be one inch from the point to the end. So I busted out my strap cutter, also bought from Tandy. Seriously. Every leather tool I have is bought from Tandy. You can just assume this is like one giant Tandy commercial. <laughs> but I busted this thing out and cut strips of leather at an inch and three quarters wide. Then keeping the point right against one edge of the strap, I went ahead and started punching my scale shapes. Just lining each end up with the last punch to kind of make this sawtooth chain type pattern. Once done, I had these strips of leather with all these scales along the bottom edge. I also had a bunch of these little triangle shaped things that I don't know what to do with. I hate wasting leather, so if you guys have any cool projects you think I could do with those things, leave it in the comment section below. I ended up making a whole bunch of these things to make my scale pattern. Before I get too far though, I don't want to leave these scales unfinished. So I began the arduous task of beveling every single one of those edges. And if I didn't have the beginnings of carpal tunnel before, this is probably what's gonna put me over the edge. To really finish it off and slick those edges down, I went in with a paintbrush with some water just to get them moist. Then I went back in with the other side of that paintbrush and just rubbed vigorously along those edges to push all those fibers down. This actually worked out really well and gave me super smooth edges. The next step was to lay all of these down in rows to see how wide of a piece I'd actually need to fit inside that ab space. With seeing exactly where it falls, it was easy to just kind of mark it with a pencil and then go back in with a ruler and add lines to all of those rolls. Then I just cut each individual piece to shorten them to exactly what I needed. And again, you want to make sure you have at least that three quarter inch overhang everywhere that it's going to be draping underneath, right? With those cut, I could use the other side of those strips to pile even more up and give me the height I needed to fill that space. So those are all the pieces. Before I start putting everything together though, I want to get everything cleaned up and dyed. So I went ahead and did the standard beveling of the edges and slicking them down. I also wanted to add a border around everything, so I cased the leather, wetting it down with a sponge so that I can take some tooling. Then went back in with my wing dividers to give myself about an inch of a border all the way around my pieces. Once the borders were in place, it was time for my swivel knife to come out and cut in those lines. Finally, I used my bevel stamp to indent all along those lines to really make that border pop out. Using a beveler is super clutch. It really helps to make your tooling marks stand out. Now for all along the edges that I'm gonna be adding rivets to, rather than just kind of try to measure them out and make little marks, I just use my wing divider and walk them all along that space which leaves little tiny points on the leather. 
Those I just went back in and punched out with my hole punch. Then I laid that piece of leather on top of the piece that will go below it and used an awl to punch through those holes so I can make sure the marks land exactly where they need to be. This made it really simple to punch those out too and be super confident as to where they land. I found I was also able to use those temporary rivets to put my actual leather pieces together to test them out. Doing this made it easy to attach the next piece along that line so that I can make sure everything lined up exactly where it needed to be and all the holes would match. This took out all of the guesswork and made it so that I could actually put all of my pieces together to see what they look like without risking messing anything up. Such a slick little trick. Again, I love that. All right, so now it's time to drop some color on these bad boys. Since the theme color of like the clan I belong to, the Rivlins, is green, we're gonna use some green. And then since my character is like a nefarious type, we're gonna drop in some black as well. So I started again by just wetting down all of my leather, which just helps make the dye take a little bit more evenly. Then I decided to try a little experiment by hitting the entire piece with my green color first. The thought being that when I go back in with the black over the trim, it'll easily cover over the green anywhere I wanted it. Just allowing me to be a little bit faster with that lighter color. This only kind of worked. I actually wouldn't recommend doing this because for some reason in all those trim areas where I'd end up going back over with black, it's almost like the, the leather got too saturated with dye and it didn't want to take in anymore. So although it got a lot darker, almost black, you can definitely still see a little bit of green coming through. So it's more worth it to just go over it carefully and make sure you do like each piece separately. Not a big problem. The black trim here definitely looks good, but lesson learned for next time. Now for my scales, my thought was to kind of rivet each one of those rows together, like right underneath one of the scales at a rivet so that everything could stick together. But this was going to take a lot of time. So I actually ended up having a really good idea. I started by just taking this two ounce piece of leather and roughly hitting it with my base color green. This way, if you can somehow see through any of the scales at all, it would just be green underneath. Next, I busted out some of this scotch double tape that's gonna help me keep my scales in place where I need them while I work. This I just added to the top back of my scale strips and stuck it to my two ounce piece of leather. Then I busted out my beautiful workhorse $100 sewing machine from Amazon and just followed along the top edge of that strip to lock it into place. From the outside, this may seem like more work, but like punching all of the holes for the rivets, then putting the rivets in place and then setting the rivets actually ends up being way longer than just running this through my machine. Doing this, I was able to bust this entire panel out with no problem. Next, I lay the rest of the armor on top of those scales and used an awl to mark where each one of my holes would land. Then I punched those holes out with my hole punch. From there, it was super easy to just drop in some rapid rivets and lock everything together into place. And I am really happy with how simple putting these scales together turned out. Look at how slick that looks. All the scales are super tight together and it just, it honestly looks really cool. I'm, ah, I love that. That came out so good. Now there is some sticking out from the bottom here, but that works out well because now I can go back in with my razor knife and cut away the excess, making that underlayment exactly the right shape to fit where it needs to be. Of course, I did the same exact thing with the small panel in the back, locking it into place as well, and then cutting away all of the excess. Again, look at how dope that looks. And the back side of it, I just stained black to match everything else and also covered up those raw edges with stain to hide them. I also took a little bit of time to bend the leather so it looks more like the muscular back shape I'd like. Now, while riveting everything together, there was one area where three thick panels kind of overlapped each other. This made it way too thick for me to actually put a rivet through. This ended up being kind of tricky for me to figure out, so I figured I'd go over it with you in case you ever come up against something like this. What I ended up doing was I added actually a second hole on the bottom two most panels. Doing this, I was able to fit a rivet there to connect those two bottom layers together. Then I used the original holes to connect the top two layers together with a rivet, locking everything into place. Basically, I just kind of laddered rivets together, connecting the bottom and the middle piece, and then the middle and the top piece to make it all one piece. I hope that made sense. It took me a little bit to work that out. <laughs> With that figured out, I just went through and set all of the rest of my panels into place, putting them where they need to go and locking them in with my rivets. Then I went back over everything with a cloth just to make sure all of the dye was polished and any excess was rubbed off and cleaned. Next, I decided to hit it with some of this leather balm with Atom Wax. This does a really good job of adding just a little bit more moisture back to the leather, mellowing out the colors a bit, and acting as a really light resist when I antique the leather. You'll notice I hit all the green areas first and then go back around to hit the black border. 
This is just in case any of that black did still want to rub off. I didn't want to drag it into the green. I've made this mistake before. I'm learning. <laughs> Next, it was time to add some of the antiquing gel. Because I don't want it to darken up too much, I'm going to go panel by panel, putting the antique gel where I need it to go, and then immediately wiping it away. This stuff is great at darkening all the little lines and crevices in the natural leather, and making the whole thing look much more aged and realistic, rather than kind of like a toy. You can see how it settles into all the spaces between the scales and adds a lot of depth and shadow underneath them. Alright, at this point, I wanted to bust out a really cool trick I saw. I got this one from Black Raven Armory's YouTube channel. I'll leave the link to the video in the description below, but basically they showed in order to get some like extra depth to your pieces, all you need to do is bust out some of this steel wool here. Using it, I was able to lightly brush my leather, adding highlights to all the high points or exposed areas that would end up getting more wear and tear and rub on them from natural use. Using this technique made the tips of those scales really stick out, and also areas that I want to look more like muscle tone come to the fore. Those highlights make the muscles look higher and then everything else kind of seem deeper into shadow. This is such a cool technique. Look at how cool that came out. Of course, I did the same thing with the front panel, adding my antique and then highlighting those things to get this fantastic result. It's such a simple trick, but look at how much more depth and interest this piece has. This is so cool. All right, home stretch. Last thing we need are some straps to kind of hold everything together. Now, I'm not going to bore you with how to make straps. Again, check out the playlist. I've covered it a million times. But I did figure out a cool little trick for myself. The part I hate most about making straps is sitting there and trying to, like, use your slicker brush all along the edge. Even if I laid on the edge of a table, it's just a pain. So instead, I took this bar of wax and rubbed it along the sides. Then I simply grabbed the strap in a rag, applying pressure to the edges as I quickly pulled the strap out. After doing this a few times, my edges were actually left perfectly slick, really smooth. That took me from like 10 minutes of slicking to just a few seconds. It worked out so well. I'm so happy that worked. These straps I just ended up turning into little belts that I added to the back sides of the armor. Then on the front, I added corresponding buckles to help lock everything into place. I also did the same thing in the shoulder area where the two panels will meet. That's adjustable too, so everything slides and overlaps on top of each other, so as it tightens and loosens, there won't be any gaps in that armor. And look at how friggin' gorgeous this thing came out! I am over the moon with how cool this is! The leather is beautiful and feels so good, and the fit is perfect. I can move around, and I feel like I can actually fight in this thing. And the highlights, because of the steel wool, really bring this thing to the next level. It was so cool to tackle the skill that I did before, and just see how far, like, my skills have come in making this thing. Not just in how nice it looks, but just learning, like, how your body works and how it should fit on you. Again, special thanks to Tandy Leather for sponsoring this. They were really cool about it, too. They are like, I don't know, just do whatever you want for an episode. You don't have to say anything special or sell anything. But for real, everything I use here for leather is from Tandy. I've loved them for a long time, and every time I get into kind of a, a bind where I don't know what to do, I go to my local Tandy, and the staff there is super helpful. So yeah, they get my, my hard stamp of approval. Long time coming. I'm so glad they're like part of the channel here. That's awesome. Okay, we have one more piece of business to get to here. Something that some of you have really been waiting for. But we must announce the winners of our Level Up LARP competition. If you're unfamiliar with this, we've partnered with Berg Snyder, purveyor of fine medieval gear, to hold the contest that'll ultimately send one of you with us to the largest LARP in the world in Germany, Conquest. If you want to learn the details, check it out here. It's not too late for you to play too. But now it's time to announce the winners. To do that, I'm going to have our friends over at Berg Snyder take over from here. Hello, hello, hello. It's Niklas here from Burgschneider and we're here with season two. Level two of Level Up LARP has concluded and we're here to announce the winners. So, okay, for our first pick, we will go with our wild card. We picked Melissa Matos. As you can see, she did an amazing job with her dragon inspired costume, with all the smocking she did, with all the different textures she, she used, with all the different materials and with the depth that this really showed. She was one of the more active members in the community, showed great participation with all of you there, great give great crafting tips, a well-deserved wild card for this level two. So next up is our third place. So in for third place, we picked Edora Trentada. I'm super sorry. Um, she modified a, a, a Tharia skirt that we had. She added lots of trims, like lots and lots of trims on there. And she did an amazing and meticulous job on these. And um, the one thing we really like to see here was the usability as a cloak of the skirt, which we haven't seen so much yet. 
She has a very coherent look in her costume and she added hooks on the waistband to make it a bit easier to adjust and take on and take off. In general, a very coherent costume, nicely done, well deserved. So let's go ahead and get on with place number two, placement number two. And there we have Mia Streif with her also Ataria skirt that we see here. And uh, she used it both as a cape and as a skirt. And you can see a very clear message here. Everything screams moth or fey, something kind of insectoid, but also playful and quirky. <laughs> And we really enjoyed the texture that she put onto the skirt here. You can see all the veins in the leaves, the little distressing details in there, very nicely put together. And also this playful realization with the great background that she provided to us. Also very well-deserved second place here. And now for our first place that we have for the second season of Level Up Lab, we picked Rachel. Rachel blew as a wave. Rachel did an amazing job with adding all of these little details, adding all of the little embroidery that she did, very in-depth use of colors, very practical use of garments that we had here. We have the split pants with snaps in the middle and we have the hidden pocket in our Taria skirt, which is also very well executed. Also one of the members that did a great participation in the community, helped out with lots of people and all in all, well-deserved. Great backstory too. What do you want more? Well-deserved first spot here. All in all, we can say Thank you all so much. Thank you all for your representation of your characters. Thank you all for the participation that you did in our challenge. Thank you all for all of the great tips, for all of the help, all the community support you provided, which is what our hobby is based on and which we really like to promote and which we all love so much to see. We would also like to announce our third season. Level three is coming up. We are all about cloaks, caps, hoods and hats for you, everything for the outer shell, everything for your hat. And we're happy to announce season three for the 31st of March, ending 27th of May. So from all of us here at Burgschneider, thanks so much for being a part of this. Stay crafty. Congratulations to all of you winners. It is amazing to watch what you guys come up with and how cool your stories are. It has been an amazing experience to watch. So thank you all for playing. And if you didn't win this time around, or again, you want to jump in, there's still another round coming up. Now, of course, if you like what you've seen here today, why don't you give me some of that thumbs up love and don't forget to subscribe so you know when I release new content. In the meantime, though, keep leveling up, you. You made it to the end screen. YouTube loves it when you do that. It is a fantastic way to support this channel. Another fantastic way to support this channel is by joining these people's noble ranks. These are my Patreon members. And without them, we couldn't do any of this. So thank you all from the bottom of my heart. And a special thank you to our newest high tier level Patreon members. Sally Not, Angry Jesus. And a big special thank you to Yuri Sacharo, I think it is. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but your donation was, uh, I mean, it's incredible. Thank you so much. If you like what we do here and want to support this channel, why don't you consider joining our Patreon? Link in the description below. Or you can click on one of these episodes here, and that'll help too. Both of them are good. I made them. I'm happy with them. Cheers. <laughs>